before we start today's video, I just want to say it's bloody hot here in Wales. So, um, if you hear a fan, that's why it's really, really hot. It's one of those magical things called a heat wave in the UK that we do not really have that much. Oh well, never mind. Best get on with the video then, shall I? The ARA 25 de Mayo did not start off life as the de Mayo. From this point on, I'll be calling her the de Mayo, as to not offend any of my Spanish or Argentine viewers with my god awful Spanish pronunciation. Wasn't good at it in school. Anyway, she would actually be known as HMS Venerable and then later HNLMS Carl Durman. So many names for just one ship. Well, she kind of gets around a lot. She would be part of one of the Colossus class aircraft carriers, which were part of the 1942 light fleet carrier design. She'd be ordered on August 7th of 1942 from Camel Laird Shipyards, where she'd be laid down on December 3rd, 1942, being launched a year later and amazingly commissioned no later than November of 1944, just under two years from laying down to operational. She would be 192 metres long, 24.4 metres wide, and have a draft of 7.5 metres. She would displace 19,900 tonnes, which is about 3,000 tonnes less than an Invincible class light aircraft carrier, or some people like to call them a through-deck cruiser. However, moving aside from that uh, little debacle, she would be powered by four water tube three drum boilers producing 40,000 shaft horsepower, powering two steam turbines, which then powered two propellers, powering her to 25 knots. A bit slow for an aircraft carrier, especially a British aircraft carrier. However, her range was actually very good. 12,000 nautical miles at 14 knots, which is from Portsmouth Naval Base to HMS Tamar in Hong Kong, with about 1,500 nautical mile range spare. A travel time of 35 days if she sailed continuously, something that she would do after commissioning. Like most ships, she would have to replenish at sea or alongside. Now, this was mainly for the replenishment of AVCAT, which is the fuel the aircraft would use, as well as obviously replenishing the food for her 1,300 officers, ratings, and embarked Air Force, or as they like to be called in the Royal Navy, WAFUs. Don't know what WAFU means? Go take a look at the uh, Jack's Peak Dictionary. As long as you're over the age of 18, then it's perfectly good to go and have a look at it. Now, the radar fits are as follows. So, this is why I see from the image. It's not actually uh, listed, but what I can see is they've got one Type 277 height finding delta band radar with a range of about 11 nautical miles, as well as multiple Type 262 fire control India band radars for the ship's 40mm guns, capable out to 5 nautical miles. The ship's self defense weapon systems would consist of four 3 pounder saluting guns. 24 2 pounder pom pom guns, capable out to 1.98 nautical miles, as well as 19 40mm Bofors guns. These were capable out to 3.9 nautical miles. She would be rated for 39 to 44 aircraft, and these would be a mixture of the F 4U Corsair fighter and the Ferry Barracuda torpedo bomber. And this is actually what she would carry into war after commissioning in January of 1945. In February of 45, she would work up ready to proceed to the Far East. Her aircraft would embark at this time, and by the 1st of March, she became the flagship of the 11th Aircraft Carrier Squadron, consisting of her sister ships, the Colossus, Glory, and Vengeance. During this time, a flag officer would join the ship and overlook the preparations for her deployment. By the 12th, she was ready, and she would sail for Malta to carry out exercises with vessels of the Mediterranean fleet, basically to prepare her for her Pacific service. She would remain here until May, when she would proceed to Ceylon, which is modern-day Sri Lanka, where she would dock in Trincomalee, I believe, where the Corsair and Barracuda aircraft would be modified for service in the Pacific. I'm assuming making the aircraft more in line with the American aircraft, who could serve in the Pacific theatre, as it was hotter and more humid than the Atlantic than most of the aircraft the fleet arm had been operating in. Obviously, someone's going to point out the F4U Corsair is an American aircraft, and not going to lie, I don't actually really understand what they've done to, well, make these aircraft fit for Pacific service. Anyway, I couldn't find it in the research. So, 
carrying on. So she would then sail to Sydney and join the Pacific Fleet in July, which was part of the US Third Fleet, and she would arrive on the 22nd of July. In August, she would be forward deployed in Sydney, but she wouldn't sail because there was a decision to be made about future service with the Third Fleet. Possibly something to do with Admiral King, I don't really know. Anyway, it would be understandable because, you know, what King actually does when it turns to, uh, you know, interoperability with the US and Royal Navies. So, she'd have her 20mm Orlikan cannons replaced with 40mm guns, a major improvement in the anti-aircraft department. So, on the 15th of August, she sailed as part of Task Force 112 under Royal Navy control for operations to bring back the Empire, sorry, I mean uh, reoccupy Hong Kong, where she would operate out of Subic Bay with HMS Indomitable, a modern large fleet carrier. Along with HMS Euryalus and Swiftshaw, a Dido class anti aircraft cruiser and a Minotaur class light cruiser, respectively. And finally, the Canadian auxiliary Prince Robert. She would then be screened by the destroyers Camberfeld, Eurisa, and Whirlwind, along with the Australian destroyer HMAS Quadrant. En route, she would refuel from the forward base in Manus in the Admiralty Islands, where she would continue a day later, arriving at Subic Bay on the 27th. On the 29th, the King George V class battleship HS Anson joined up with the task force and they joined up at Hong Kong. But their entry into the bay was delayed because of counter mine operations. By the end of August, Indomitable and Venerable, along with the three cruisers and four destroyers of Task Group 111.2, under the command of Rear Admiral CJJH Harcourt CB CBE, arrived off Hong Kong to accept the Japanese surrender. As they approached the harbour, suicide boats appeared from La Masse Bay and sped towards the cruisers. Aircraft from the carriers attacked and destroyed the boats, allowing the task force to enter the harbour safely. By September, she would provide support during the reoccupation of Kulun, as well as bringing the transport vessel for Indian nationals held as prisoner of wars in Indo-French China. It's good to note here that on the 15th of August, Emperor Hirohito announced the surrender of the Japanese after two nukes had been dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, with the formal surrender occurring on the 2nd of September. So the war was now over, but Venerable was still there, and by October, a month after the surrender, being signed on the deck of the USS Missouri, she made her passage to Haiphong to embark her passengers, arriving on the 17th, and she sailed on the 21st for Madras in with the Indian nationals on board, arriving on the 27th. After disembarkation, she sailed for Trincomalee the same day, arriving the next day, where she landed her aircraft and squadron personnel, as she would be used more as a transport for personnel. In November, she would transport military personnel to Singapore, as well as running stores from Bombay to the Dutch East Indies. By December, she embarked personnel for passage to Java, where she disembarked all personnel and stores, but reloaded Dutch nationals who would be held by internees by the Japanese. Some 729 evacuees, 570 of those being women and children. She dropped them off in Colombo and embarked her aircraft, where she transited to Sydney. She would sail from Sydney to Fremantle for Christmas, but sailed on Boxing Day for Sydney, arriving on New Year's Eve. When 1946 rolled around, she'd be put into refits in January, which would include post-refit trials and a return to moving more troops for the most of the year, where she would then dock and refit in Singapore in October for two weeks, returning to sea on the 6th of November, arriving in Hong Kong on the 26th. In December, she would operate from Hong Kong, where she would take part in exercises with ships of the Pacific Fleet. In 1947, she would continue her deployment around Hong Kong until the end of January that year, when she would be nominated for return to the UK and reduced into the reserve service. By Valentine's Day, she would head for Plymouth, and by March, she was in the Mediterranean, and then by the 26th of March, she arrived in Plymouth and paid off into reserve. By then, she would be up for sale, and by January 1948, negotiations with Holland were underway. 
She would be bought by the Dutch on the 1st of April, no April Fool's jokes here, and she prepared for service in the Royal Netherlands Navy, being commissioned as the HMNLS. In her early years, she would carry a cable air wing, suitable for close air support and aerial attack, consisting of up to 24 fireflies and sea furies. For rescue duties, a yellow sea otter would be included, but this would later be replaced by an S-51 helicopter. From 1955 until 1958, she'd be extensively refitted, which many new developments in naval aviation was added. The notable parts of this refit would include the ripping off of the British style superstructure and adding a Dutch designed one, which included a large lattice mast and taller funnel, which atop would sit the LW01 and LW02 radars which would be on the lattice mast and funnel respectively. Now additionally to this, the ships would have two nodding height finding radars on the forward end of the superstructure and on the aft end of the superstructure, all in all for four. Additionally to this, the ships would have a angled flight deck, quote unquote, as well as the addition of an extension to the catapult that's taken off the front end of the ship as you can see in the picture above. Additionally to this, the close range weapon systems would be replaced by 10 Bofors 40mm cannons. And that would basically be the entire refit. To change from basically being a light carrier of the British Navy to a fully operational angle flight deck light carrier. And following on from the uh, refit, the Carl Durman then operated the 14 Avengers, 10 Seahawks, and two S 55 helicopters as well as acting as the flagship for Task Force 5. The main deployment areas was the Northern North Sea, except for a little trip to Florida, together with the destroyers of the Friesland and Holland class, as well as sometimes with a Walrus class submarine. So those aircraft fitted and the much improvement of the ship in terms of the refit made the ships better for, obviously, with aircraft, for self-defense, as well as the better radars for radar horizon coverage. All in all, a very, very good refit. Now, let's move on, shall we? So by 1961, the Carl Durman was equipped with the latest avionics, and again, her air wing would change. Tasked by NATO, the Royal Netherlands Navy was to perform anti-submarine patrols in the North Atlantic. Now, the Carl Durman would be becoming the base for eight Grumman Tracker S2F aircraft, as well as six helicopters of the S-58 variant. Again, as flagship of the Task Force 5, operating from Invergorgon in Scotland, the Carl Dorman frequently was accompanied by the destroyers, the Limburg, Grigorin, Drenith, and Holland, as well as a submarine of the Dolphin class. And then later escorts would become the Broadbean Leanders of the Van Spiek class. I'm sorry, Netherlands, if I just absolutely butchered your language, I'm really, really sorry. Please don't come kill me. Moving quickly on. So in late April of 1968, a major boiler room fire put the ship out of action. The damage was that bad that to repair the ship's power plant, they'd have to rip the boilers out of the incomplete HMS Leviathan and transplant them into the Doraman. However, by 1969, it was decided that the cost of repairing the ship in relation to how long she would remain in service with the Dutch Navy, it would be easier to sell her. And sell them, they did. But who, they ask? Well, the Argentine Navy. And in March 1969, she would change hands into the Argentine Navy, being commissioned as the ARA Uvento Cinco de Mayo, named after Argentina's Independence Day that of the 25th of May. She wasn't the only carrier to be operating with the Argentine Navy at this time. There would be the ARA Independencia, the ex-HMS or HMCS warrior. No points for guessing what her name stands for. So, with the De Mayo now in service with Argentina, she would then become the only Argentine carrier in service after the Independencia became an independent ship at the Breakers Yard in 1971. Now, the De Mayo's air group consisted of F9F Panthers and F9F Cougar Jets, which would then later be replaced by the A4Q Skyhawks, 
supported by S2 Tracker anti-submarine warfare aircraft, as well as the Sikorsky Sea King helicopter. In September of 1969, during the voyage of the recently bought Defender Cinco from the Netherlands, Hawker Sydney demonstrated the Harrier GR1 on board the carrier for possible sale to the Argentine Navy, believe it or not. Oh, how the Falklands War could have changed if they actually bought a Harrier jump jet. Ah, well, never mind. We'll never know because they didn't. So, during the 1970s, the ship was refitted and updated several times. Through in each case, the duration of each repair period was never more than three to five months, allowing her the ability to deploy at any time. Her last pre Falklands War refit occurred during 1981, when she received an update to her radars, rest gear, steam catapult, and most notably the forward edge of the port angled flight deck was filled out via a large sponson. Now these quote improvements would theoretically enable her to operate the Superintendard strike aircraft that they just purchased from the French, but it was discovered during testing that the catapult had difficulties launching the aircraft. As a result, her strike air wing was then limited to the A4Q Skyhawks. In 1978, she was planned to support the invasion of Picton, Nueva and Lennox Islands during the Beagle conflict dispute. However, Argentina backed down and she wouldn't be used. Now, after the 1981 refit, 1982, surprisingly enough, rolled around and she'd be testing the new aircraft, which was really going that well, surprisingly enough. But she would use the Skyhawks, which I guess would be a plus from her. Anyway, with the invasion of the Falklands, the catalyst that started the war, she would be assigned to support the initial landings. On the day of the invasion, she waited with about 1,500 soldiers at High Stanley Harbour, as the first submarine and boat landing of the commandos secured landing areas and then the Argentine Marines made their main amphibious landing. Her aircraft would not be used during the invasion. Later in the defence of the occupation, she would deploy as the task force to the north of the Falklands, with the General Belgrano to the south. Now the British had assigned HMS Splendid, a nuclear powered attack submarine, to track down the De Mayo and sinker if necessary. Rear Admiral Sandy Woodward, commander of the British task force from HMS Hermes, stated in his book 100 Days, that Splendid, or had Splendid located the carrier, he would have recommended to the strongest possible terms to the Commander-in-Chief, Admiral Sir John Fieldhouse, that we take them both out this night. Now, after hostilities broke out on the 1st of May 1982, the Argentine carrier attempted to launch a wave of A4Q Skyhawk jets against the Royal Navy Task Force, after her S2 trackers detected the British fleet. If this went ahead, however, this would have been the first time two aircraft carriers had gone to battle since World War II. However, this did not take place as the light winds prevented the heavily loaded jets from being launched. After the British nuclear powered submarine HMS Conqueror sank the General Belgrano, the Ventacinto Tomeo returned to port for her own safety. Splendid never tracked down the carrier, and the naval A4Q Skyhawks flew from the rest of the war from the airbases in Rio Grande and Terra de Fuego, and had some success against the Royal Navy, sinking HMS Ardent. However, three Skyhawks would be shot down by the Sea Harriers. Ironically enough, do you think that would have happened if they actually did buy the uh, Harriers? I don't know. We'll ever know. With the war lost, the Argentines were sporting a bloody nose, and didn't really push for much afterwards. Most of the fleet remained close to Argentine waters, as well as the De Mayo. However, soon after starting to get some major problems with her engines, and was largely kept in port, she was deemed practically unseaworthy. Argentina, at this point, was in economic crisis. The military junta was failing, and they couldn't really raise funds to modernise or even replace the dilapidated engines. She was good enough useless and destined for razor blades. In 1997, she was decommissioned and was stripped of everything that was basically working to keep a sister ship, the Brazilian Minas Gerais, operational, which was, funny enough, another modified Colossus class aircraft carrier that the Netherlands had got their hands on. 
At the turn of the millennium, the De Mayo was towed to the great ship-breaking beaches of Alang in India. This is where she would join her sister ships as pots, pans, and razor blades. However, the Minas Gerais was offered to Argentina in 2000 as a replacement, but this would be rejected, however. She was in bad condition and in need of restoration, and had high maintenance costs. I'm not going to lie, by this point, she was a 60-year-old ship. Anyway, the De Mayo's airwing would live on, however, operating from the Sao Paulo until she was decommissioned in 2017. All in all, she was a good ship, but she would be hampered in modern day for launching jet aircraft due to her slow speed, especially after her boiler fire knocking out, well, knocking off a couple of her knots off her top speed. Oh well. The ARA Juntas. Oh, damn it! The Juntas Cinco de Mayo? No. Definitely not, no. The Argentine warship Vantacinto de Mayo did not start off life as the de Mayo. From this point on, I'll be calling her the de Mayo, as to not offend any of my Spanish or Argentinian videos. Oh, no, it's not videos? Viewers off. That <laughs> stupid bloody script. <laughs> However, she would be known as Hatred's Venerable and later HNLMS Carl Durman. So many needs for just one ship. Well, she gets around a lot. <laughs> yes. She would displace 19,900 tons, 3,000 tons less than an Invincible class through deck cruiser or a light aircraft carrier. She would be powered by four water tube three drum boilers producing 40,000 shaft horsepower through two steam turbines. Turbines? Not from Somerset, for God's sake. <sighs> Gonna have to read it that one then. However, the Minas Gerais was offered to Argentina in 2000 as a replacement, but this was rejected. She was an old fart <laughs> and a bit crap. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, so that's the end of that video. Hopefully, you learned something new, because I most certainly did. Now, if you want to go and support the channel, there is a link in the description below to the Patreon page. I would recommend doing it, but is up to you. Also, if you want to come and talk to me, there's a link in the description for the Discord channel. There's a couple of good guys over there. We talk about a wide variety of stuff. So yeah, so thanks for watching guys. Hit that notification button to stay up to date with what I'm uploading. And obviously give it a like, give it a subscribe if you really want to, and comments are always good. I like reading your comments. So take care. Catch you next time.